Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Casey, and I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. On behalf of the Berkeley Center and our co-sponsors, the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life here at Georgetown, uh, La Civita Cattolica, and the Georgetown Representative Office in Rome, I would like to welcome all of you to this, what promises to be a wonderful discussion about the Pope's recent trip to Iraq. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And I especially want to thank our co-sponsors for their support of this great conversation. First, we are recording this event. And if you uh, apply, if you formally registered for the event, it will be posted on our website shortly and you will receive an email notifying you when the video is available. Second, we hope to preserve some time for audience questions in our last segment. So we ask you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and frankly, start submitting your questions during the early conversation so that we'll have a robust set of questions for our two speakers today. Uh, third, uh, the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life has an upcoming event on March 18th at 1230, which we think you might be interested in. It's entitled The Francis Factor at Eight Years, Global Impacts, U.S. Challenges. And there's going to be an all-star lineup, including people such as Cardinal Sean O'Malley and Cardinal Peter Turkson. And the RSVP link for that event can be found uh, in the chat column momentarily. And finally, forgive me for a moment of shameless commerce. Uh, Father Spadaro is an expert on the theology of the internet. So we're giving out Twitter handles here for a number of our participants and we'll probably post those in the chat as well. But for the moment, you can follow me at SeanCasey57, that's all one word, the Berkeley Center at GU Berkeley Center. And you can follow the initiative of Cath on Catholic Social Thought at G-U-C-S-T, public life, all one word. And you can follow, follow La Civiltà Cattolica at C-I-V is in Victor, C-A-T-T. -T. And you can follow our two speakers today uh, at Antonio Spadaro, all one word, and at R-I-C-I-S-T-I-A-N-O-1. So for all of those who you are Twitter nerds out there, you know how to stay in touch with all of us who are on the program today. Let me now take a moment and introduce our two uh, prestigious and fabulous guests. Father Antonio Spadaro is the editor in chief of the Jesuits biweekly review, La Civiltà Cattolica. Since entering the Society of Jesus in 1988, he has worked in a variety of capacities, including joining the reviews community in 1998. He's been part of the review ever since. Since late 2011, he became the review's editor-in-chief. Father Spadaro considers his work to be part of the new cyber theology, quote-unquote, thinking faith in the internet age. He recently accompanied Pope Francis on his trip to Iraq. Ricardo Cristiano is an Italian journalist and Vatican expert who reports on interreligious dialogue, religion, and international affairs. He's the author of a recent book on Pope Francis, and I will not attempt to pronounce the Italian title, but the translation into English is Berberglio or Barbarism. And I don't believe that's been translated into English yet, but if, if that's the case, Ricardo, please, please uh, correct my error. Uh, he's also been a contributor to Radio RAI, La Stampa, and Reset Dialogues on Civilizations. So let's jump into our conversation. First, uh, Father Spadaro is going to speak, then Ricardo. So Father Spadaro, tell us uh, your reflections on the Pope's recent trip to Iraq. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very glad to be here with you for just sharing my experience. Uh, the, uh, my experience of being in Iraq with Pope Francis for this uh, fabulous trip. And uh, this uh, was the 33rd apostolic journey. Uh, this journey fulfills a desire that was already felt by St. John Paul II. In his Jubilee pilgrimage of 2000, uh, Wojtyla went first to Mount Sinai and then following month uh, to Jerusalem. His desire was to prepare uh, these two pilgrimages together with the one to Ur in Iraq. The trip was ready in December 1999, but it was not possible to make it. The United States, led by Bill Clinton, feared that the Pope's presence uh, would have strengthened Saddam Hussein. 
But in the end, Saddam himself opposed the, the, the trip after an initial positive feedback to the proposal. So St. John, John Paul II then raised his voice against the second Western military expedition in the country, the war of 2003, which ended with the overthrow of uh, Saddam's government. But he was not heard. And since then, the country has, ble has been uh, plunged into a spiral of violence linked to the so-called Islamic State, a vortex from which uh, even thinking about a Pope's visit could have seemed a mirage. Uh, the plans that intervene in France's itinerary are multiple and can only be understood if one evaluates what Iraq is today, but also what its importance is in the history of humanity as well as religions. Mesopotamia was the cradle of great ancient uh, civilizations. And there the faith of Abraham was born. There Islam made one of its first conquests and experienced the division between Sunnis and Shiites. After the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, present-day Iraq was entrusted in 1920 by the League of Nations to the British administration with the Treaty of Sèvres. It became an independent monarchy in 1932 and a republic on July 14, 1958. The land is also steeped into the blood of countless recent conflicts, most notably the two Gulf, uh, Gulf Wars in 1991 and 2003. The slow and difficult process of normalization in the country came to, uh, to an abrupt halt in, in 2014 with the rise of the so-called Islamic State, which was defeated in December 2017. And today the country's political stability is very fragile. The weight of conflict um, has also fallen on the shoulders of Christians. On the eve of the second Gulf War, Christians in Iraq were estimated at 6% of the population. Since then, their presence has been drastically reduced until, according to the most recent estimates, um, it has fallen to about 1.5%. For this reason, rebuilding trust is essential and the creation of uh, Christian enclaves must be ruled out. The core of the message that Pope Francis wanted to deliver to the country is to be united, overcoming uh, rival rivalries and oppositions, considering religious, cultural and ethnic diversity, which has characterized the Iraqi society for millennia as a precious resource that requires a healthy pluralism. Um, the, the first speech he gave uh, to the authorities uh, of Iraq indicated two paths to building a healthy Iraqi civil society. It was very impressive to be there, to be honest. So to see a pope uh, among the authorities of Iraq in Baghdad. So the, the two path, uh, the first one uh, is internal and uh, I can summarize it in a word, which is citizenship. For Francis, uh, space must be given to all citizens who want to build this country together. It's essential in this sense to ensure the participation of all political, social and religious groups and to guarantee the fundamental rights of all citizens. No one should be considered a second class citizen. So first word, citizenship. The second one, the second is external to Iraq, is the commitment of the international community. The challenges require cooperation on a global scale in order to also address the economic inequalities and regional tension, uh, tensions that threaten the stability of these lands. Uh, we are the antipodes of the colonialistic vision that has dominated in the assessment of what the Middle East should have been. Uh, a key stop, a key visit on Francis' visit was Najaf, uh, which is Iraq's main Shiite religious center and a pilgrimage 
destination for Shiites from uh, around the world because it houses the tomb of Imam Ali, uh, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law and the Shiites' first Imam. Uh, the Pope visited the Grand Al Ayatollah Al-Sistani. The interpretation of Islamic revelation advocated by Al-Sistani preaches uh, the abstention of religious authorities from direct political activity. In this sense, it differs from the interpretation of Ayatollah Khomeini that prevailed in Iran. In 2004, he supported the free elections in Iraq, thus making an important contribution to the planning of the first democratic government in the country. While in 2014, he called on Iraqis to um, unite, to fight against the so-called uh, Islamic State to fight together, to be united. Many welcome posters with pictures of Francis and Al-Sistani and um, uh, with a famous saying of Imam Ali appeared in the places of papal visit. The, uh, this famous saying uh, says, people are of two types. Either they are your brothers in faith or your fellows in humanity or in creation. Uh, the meeting between the Pope and the Ayatollah al-Sistani lasted about 45 minutes. And the two leaders, as reported in their respective uh, press releases, talked about the importance of cooperation between religious communities and the consolidation of the values of harmony, peaceful coexistence, and human solidarity based on the promotion of uh, rights and mutual respect among the followers of different religions and intellectual tendencies. And this is so that we can contribute to the good of the country and all humanity. So the vision of these two uh, old men, uh, Al-Sistani is uh, older than 90, Pope Francis, Francis 84, these two big leaders are very similar. And uh, Al-Sistani um, played a very relevant role in the um, inside of the Iraqi society. Uh, Francis Tripp turns uh, the, uh, the spotlight on Najaf, uh, Shiite's holy city, and brings back um, the non-theocratic Shiite's theology and proposed the relevance in reconciliation of Abraham, the patriarch common to the free monotheisms. Muhammad Ali Abtahi, former vice president of, president of Iran and a close associate of former president Muhammad Khatami on Twitter commented, undoubtedly this meeting is the historical milestone of the divine religions, which is a pretty relevant statement. Uh, the message of Al-Sistani's visit is the peaceful recognition of a plural Islam and more generally of states as uh, plural subjects, uh, a premise to guarantee citizenship to all. Prime Minister al Kadimi uh, has received the message uh, and on Twitter, he himself wrote in celebration of the historic meeting in the draft between Ayatollah al-Sistani and Pope Francis in the historic interreligious meeting in the ancient city of Ur, we declare March the 6th as a national day of tolerance and coexistence in Iraq. The meeting that the Pope hopes uh, opts for is not as uh, in other agreements functional to be united against somebody. The so-called Abraham Pact wanted by President Trump between Israel and the Gulf monarchies is essentially in anti-Iranian function drawing a distinction between good and bad, goodies and baddies, if you want. The piece that Najaf and soon after Ur hints that is not against anybody, and not binary, good guys versus bad guys, but it's deeply respectful and inclusive. Uh, so uh, Francis, in a very charming way, because the meeting of these two leaders uh, was very charming, and um, Francis insinuates uh, himself into and destroys 
the established narratives and imperialist geopolitical strategies that see all the major world players active in the land. The United States and Russia, but also France and the United Kin Kingdom, Christians, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, Sunnis, Iran and pro-Iranian militias, Shiites, and now even China. Um, at least uh, uh, from the commercial point of view. The first is the established narrative that has done so much harm. Christians are the fifth columns of the West, like Iran is of Shi Shiites and Saudi Arabia of Sunnis. So this narrative was destroyed. The second one is the religious narrative of a permanent conflict between Sunnis and Shiites with the prevalence of Khomeini-style theocratic uh, Shiism. Uh, Many today have discovered that Shiism is plural, and there is a traditional one, which is precisely that of Al-Sistan. The third is the complex geopolitical vision that has Baghdad as its focus, nourished and uh, by uh, apocalyptic ideology. Therefore, uh, Riyadh dreams of politically controlling Islam using Wahhabi Puritanism as an instrument of religious hegemony. On the other hand, um, Tehran dreams of returning to Persian imperialism and reaching the Mediterranean in territorial continuity, necessarily passing through Baghdad. And in all this, Moscow aspires to reach both the Strait of Ormuz and also Syria via um, the Mediterranean Sea. And in turn, Turkey, heir of the Ottoman Empire, wants to replace Istanbul with Riyadh, projecting the imperial vision of the Middle East and the Mediterranean as far as Libya. And the United States is trying to hold on to the current system, which is a light uh, to it. In his welcome speech to Iraqi president, some summed up uh, well the meaning um, of the pontiff's visit, launching the proposal of a permanent, permanent symposium for dialogue under the supervision of delegates from the Vatican, Najaf, Al-Azhar, and Zaytuna in Tunisia. And the main religious centers that reach, that reach the common and multifaceted history in the light of sacred objects and cuneiform heritage. Uh, these were uh, words uh, uh, said by the president of the Iraq. So, sitting Najaf and Al Azhar together, along with the Holy See, the president called for a harmony between Sunni and Shiites. Uh, that disrupts established narratives and geopolitics, as I uh, said you before, as I told you before. Recently, after the Pope's visit, the Prime Minister al Kadimi and the Speaker of the Iraqi Parliament, al uh, Halbuzi, invited al Azhar Grand Imam uh, um, Ahmed El Tayeb to visit Iraq. So they are very relevant steps. The founding figure of the meaning of the trip was that of Abraham in Ur, the place from which Abram left, an interreligious meeting uh, has held, was held. The religions professed on Iraqi soil were represented. Some were surprised, uh, surprised by the absence of Jewish brothers during the interreligious prayer, but actually there were no Jewish physically present because the interreligious meeting was limited to the participation of Iraqi citizens. And unfortunately, for many years now, the presence of the Jewish community in Iraq has been reduced to less than a dozen people. But the Pope in his speech was very inclusive, saying, I'm going to quote him, and today we Jews, Christians, and Muslims, along with our brothers and sisters of other religions, honor our father Abraham. So Abraham became a model of a society, of a way of doing politics, of a commitment to rebuild the country. It's an invitation to leave those ties and attachments that closes us um, in our groups and prevent us from seeing in others our brothers and sisters. But where then can the path to peace begin? The Pope him, uh, asked himself. Uh, his answers um, clearly show the way. From the renunciation of having enemies 
um, he said, whoever has the courage to look at the stars, whoever believes in God has no enemies to fight. Uh, he has only one enemy to face, who stands at the door of his heart and knocks to enter. It's enmity. Ur is no longer so just a symbol of the past, but the building site of the future. Very important was the visit to Mosul, a city occupied for three years by the troops of the self-proclaimed uh, Islamic State. The city has been subjected to systematic devastation. The Pope went to the square of uh, four churches destroyed between 2014 and 2017 by ISIS. A prayer for the victims of the war was held here. In his greeting, Francis said that the true identity of the city is that of harmonious coexistence between people of different origins and cultures. Hence the conviction that fraternity is stronger than fratricide. From Mosul, the Pope went, to, uh, went, went by helicopter to Karakosh, the main Christian city in the country. Here, uh, uh, the joy was palpable, but I can say everywhere was a joy to see the Pope there. It was kind, kind of a miracle. So the people, I, I still remember uh, sisters and, and priests and lay people, of course, dancing, singing in uh, a city that was completely destroyed by ISIS. So beauty, uh, he said, that is not monochromatic, but shines through variety of differences, which instead the destructive power of violence wants to cancel. So fanaticism is monochromatic. In the afternoon, Francis went to the Aridi Stadium where he celebrated Mass. In his homily, he concluded, today I can see and touch that the church in Iraq is alive. Um, Francis, with his trip to Iraq, which was very intense and the rhythm of the trip was incredible. Um, we had uh, even four flights a day so I even don't know how the Pope, where the Pope found the energies for uh, uh, being so vital and energetic during this trip. So Francis extinguished ev every hotbed of spurious apocalyptic thinking, which sees only martyrs and apostates, where instead we are all brothers. And it is this thought in its uh, own way a new Noah's Ark. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Father Spadaro. That, that was an intriguing and fascinating description. I wish we had five hours to go through the, the fine details, but, but that's a really impressive overview. We'll have many questions, I'm sure, at the end. Thank you. Uh, let's turn now to, to Ricardo. Ricardo, what are your thoughts about the Pope's trip? Well, first of all, let me say that I'm very grateful for this invitation. And I have to confess that I feel inadequate for the goal, which is to offer a contribution to the understanding of what kind of process Pope Francis has started with his pilgrimage in the Arab pain. That was the starting of a process is confirmed by the invitation of the Sunni Imam of Al-Azhar in Iraq, as Father Spataro mentioned the country of Ayatollah al-Sistani. That was a journey in the Arab pain is confirmed by the fact that the Arab world today is in the same condition as in the 13th century at the time of the Mongol invasions. The vast land where the clash of Pan-Arabism versus Pan-Islamism has no more any meaning. In such a place, no stability, but change is the only option. For me as a person, or rather as a human being, the poetic of the stars and the sky in the speech of the Pope from Ur is the highest point that expresses the cosmic gaze of Francis, the cosmic look on brotherhood, without putting the blame on any community. This poetic say much better than theology and philosophy that dialogue happens inside each of us. The stars are different, but the firmament is one. So 
teaches us that all the creations means living together. But my small attempt to say something is not about poetic, philosophy, theology, I couldn't, but only on a very simple question. When and where did Francis go without Western clothes as a pilgrim and a penitent? Where is the land, this land that indicates the danger of a shipwreck of our civilizations? Francis went on March and left on March 8, the day of the first military coup back in 1963 of the Ba'ath, the ruling party in Syria and Iraq for decades. March is also the month of the anniversary of the invasion of Iraq back in 2003. March is not always for military coups or invasion, can also be for brotherhood. This opened our eyes. Iraq is the place where the second Arab Spring started in Liberation Square, October 2019, the only religious and spiritual expression against the former and the new sectarian regimes equally determined to impose a materialistic vision that makes community tribes based on a sabiyya, something like comradeship. Visiting Iraq is visiting the door of the Mediterranean basin. And if there is no peace on the doorstep, no peace on the doorstep, inside the house, there can be no peace. Father Spadaro wrote immediately after the official announcement about a link between this visit and the pandemic. This meant that as we can overcome the pandemic only with unity, so we should be united with the Iraqis facing the outbreak of the apocalyptic vir virus in their land. But unfortunately, I understood this only later. But I see also a third pandemic spreading from there, the transformation of religious identity into sectarian identitarianism. The first challenge is to recognize that the virus is one, the virus is one coming from the regimes on one side and the ISIS and the equal opposite Pazdaran, a modern Janus face idol on the other. This will make easier to recognize the opposite part of the spiritual inspired protest of Liberation Square in Baghdad that then reached Marty Square in Beirut. This is the path of Abraham. This renewal of the path of Abraham in the path of men in peaceful revolt spiritually links these different individuals and our internal geographical maps, making us aware that the Mediterranean basin begin in Iraq, linking again from the natural end of the Iranian plateau Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and the Levant. But Iraq is a country with boundaries that are colonial lines in the sand, splitting ancient tribes. So without citizenship, the loyalty is not to states, but to what exists, tribes. Saying you are all brothers, Francis is the first who spoke to citizens, Arabs and non-Arabs, all along this path. He did so on his, on his gate, that is also the point where two strategic sources of the Euro-Asian bloc intersect. The one that unites Moscow with the Persian Gulf, and the one that unites Tehran and Palermo, the heart of the Mediterranean Sea. So the visit of Francis underlined that also the Iraqi virus can turn Mediterranean unless we use the vaccine of Abraham. This is the only vaccine available as a, uh, also against the grassroots grass root virus, which is Islamic nihilism. This nihilism of Islamic individuals that do not believe anymore in official Islam, in the international community, in the Arab solidarity, is the swamp where apocalyptic groups find cheap manpower looking just for a flag that will allow them to express their violence. So the 13th century that with Ibn Taymiyyah created in response to invasion, Islamic fundamentalism is now worse than then. 
with apocalyptic and nihilistic Islam. In Nur, I saw a man who told to nihilistic people, I see you, this is unprecedented. I think they didn't hurt, but official Islam now realize the existential threat because they feel no more alone. Do I trust them? I trust popular Islam. The need of friend to be heard. This is Francis. On this regard, as Father Dalloglio, kidnapped in Syria back in 2013, said, we should be aware that terrorism dehumanized the other, but we don't have to do the same in the name of fear. We will create what we fear, he said in 2012. This is a lesson that I see in any step of Francis. We could say that against the pandemic of apocalyptic and nihilistic beliefs, Francis in Iraq offered against the holy war a sort of a holy alliance of all faiths that do not believe that the world is hell and thus to be destroyed in the name of paradise. The, name, the nightmare of Islamic terror cannot erase the memory of nationalistic terror, as Armenian and the Syrians knows very well, unfortunately, has the huge number of Iraqi evicted Jews and the gas curse of al without quoting others. After centuries, are there Sabean living in Iraq? Recalling history, I felt that Francis said that the time has come to give rights to the individuals and guarantees to the community with the blessing of any faith. If we fail to do so after ISIS, Islamic nihilism will spread. We cannot separate the child ISIS from his true parents, including the regimes that go through them the nickname of lesser evils. There is always a lesser evil if you help the birth of a bigger one. This is true also for political Islam. Thus the journey united two pairs of, pilgrim, of meanings. The first, the visit to Mosul as the epicenter of the apocalyptic earthquake of ISIS and to Najaf, the headquarter of the Shia theological school that with Ayatollah al kuwi at the beginning and then with Ayatollah al-Sistani, the one who in 2019 spoke of building a civil state, always rejected the theocratic doctrine of Khomeini and the apocalyptic belief of the Pasdaran. The extreme pressure doctrine on Iran of President Trump didn't help Najaf in favoring the changes. The appeasement doctrine of President Obama neither. Is there a third way available? Islam is in danger from within. As Najaf is more than a theological school, it is the seat of the largest cemetery in the world where countless number of faithful has been buried for centuries from every corner of the world for that will to join in eternity with the founder Ali buried there at the beginning of Islam when his men were found after his assassination by his opponents, the, fut the future Umayyad Caliph. So by going to Najaf, Francis established a real relationship with every Shia because Shiism is Najaf. It it is Najaf and Karbala, where Ali son Imam Hussein was killed. The ideologue of the Iranian revolution, Ali Shariati, described the death of Imam Hussein as a choice of the, on the model of Calvary. Shariati describes him going unarmed, without soldier, aware of his fate, to offer his, his blood to save Islam. From the Umayyad, of course, but also from Black Shiism, the mortal enemy of red Shiism, the religion of dispossessed, of forgotten, not of establishment. I believe that going to Najaf, the Pope saw the root of red Shiism, that of the cemetery, of those who spend their last saving to rest with Ali and Hussein, killed on the day of Ashura in nearby Karbala. Shariati red Shiism, like the blood of the forgotten, is an important part of Shiism. And for this reason, he said, every day is Ashura, everywhere is Karbala. Shariati created a Muslim Hebrew thinking thanks to his French friendship with Christian Jews, Marxists, existentialists, 
but which, if misused, can lead to fanaticism. This Islamic thinking recalled me the thinking of Father Dallollo in love with Islam, believer in Jesus. This is not syncretism. This is the capability of living together outside the houses without windows. But why Shariati was misunderstood? It comes from the symbolic complexity of Najaf and Karbala, steeped in liberation theology that can change in ideology of antagonism that they serve an eternal enemy. This is exactly what Shariati struck dramatically when fleeing Iran before his revolution and the lawyer experienced with the removal by many of his kidnapping. This hybrid thinking make it easier to get the second pair of meaning, going to Najaf and then to Ur is the full understanding of the Iraqi protester in Liberation Square, a spiritual protest, red with the blood that the militia made gush from their flesh, friends of Abraham, because united by the thirst of brotherhood and not of sectarian identitarianism. We are at the end uh, because this brings us to Karakosh. We are familiar with the protection systems. Christians experience it firsthand for centuries, the protection of the people of the book by the Sultan. After the shame of ISIS, do they think there must always be a president Sultan to protect them? Is the clergy looking for stability or for change? Discrimination is not the destiny of Islam, eviction or massacre of any nationalism. There could be also patriotism that is not at odds with brotherhood. Francis is not a man resigned. He didn't say while shrugging, the homus Islamicus will never change. This helped to see Christian Arabs as windows of the Arab world. Hopefully the Muslim Arabs will get that if they lower if they lower all their shutters, their culture will face asphyxiation. But, is the, uh, but if the Christians are not windows, what do they are? Member of close community? Father Daloyo told me once an Arab say, one hand doesn't clap alone. This is true for both. But Francis got more. For me, he got that the cultural breakdown are resulted in a widespread authoritarianism in any sphere to the point that the unicity of God is confused with the unicity of the party or the raiz. At that time, I condemned personally the international sanctions against Iraq, but I can't forget that Uday Hussein managed all the currency black market in Baghdad. Extreme poverty is a tool for those regimes. Exactly how happened in uh, my part of Italy, the southern part of Italy with the Masia system. So we can understand that Christian quality of life is a bargaining chip for them with the West. This plague was sized by Francis, who urged the bishop not to be public employees or official, not a case. Are the bishop and the clergy ready to follow? Patriarch Sarko going to Li Patriarch Sarko, excuse me, going to Liberation Square became a moral, not a public authority. This has come also to erase anti-Judaic references and renew Arab culture. Could Christian promote a different pressure in the world? I think yes. Not only the Congress in defense of Christians that take place in the United States every year, but also a Congress in defense of human dignity in the Middle East, also for the children of former foreign fighters of ISIS languishing since years in al hol camp. Francis can change the world alone, but if the church will follow, then popular Islam will wake up. Conviviality exists and they will see Christians not as fifth columns, but as the West of the West through the Asabia perversion, but as brothers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Uh, we are running slightly behind. I was going to offer about 10 minutes of comments. I'm just going to simply 
raise three or four points and then move on to question and answer uh, for our last 15 minutes. Sitting in the United States, I noticed the, the media coverage in America had a certain wistfulness to it. On, on the one hand, there was this rich tapestry of theological symbolism, which both of you have talked about at great length. I, I think the overwhelming majority of that symbolism probably escaped the average American's perception. Uh, and yet uh, it was certainly there, certainly was woven into the trip, woven into the meetings. And the media's, uh, I, I think the wistfulness on Americans' part was simply that the rich, the theological richness of met American illiteracy on the meaning of that symbolism. But secondly, there's also fatigue in the United States about Iraq as a subject. I think far too many Americans simply want to turn their back on the ongoing history there because of the cost to our country and the shame and guilt that was attached to that in the cascading uh, political geopolitical problems. So I, I think the media picked up on that American tiredness and fatigue. And the, the coverage, while it, in some senses was robust, it was also, I think, uh, it was countered by some ongoing events here, like emerging out of the, the COVID pandemic and the vaccine rollout increasing in the United States. So the, in terms of the news of the day, the Pope story often got kicked down to secondary status, which I think was very, very unfortunate. Uh, I think there was some anxiety in the media about the COVID protocols and to the extent they were observed or not observed in Iraq, also against the background of Iraq's uh, struggle against the, the uh, pandemic and its uh, struggle to get adequate vaccines. I think that the Sistani engagement is really worth a lot of reflection and deeper reflection. And, and I thank you, uh, Father Spadaro, for your, for your analysis there. Uh, looking back from the perspective of 2021, the US government's, one of its major, major failures there was to completely misunderstand who he was and he, they failed to engage with him. And even to this day, I would be curious if there was any engagement on the part of the papal uh, uh, troop with the U.S. government entities there, particularly in the Najaf and in, in about the, the meeting with Sistani. Uh, finally, I'll simply say, I, I wonder if we have not entered an era of global declaration fatigue, that there's probably been more interreligious dialogue attempted in Iraq since 2003 than any other acreage on, on the face of the planet. And yet most of that has been government sponsored or sponsored by senior global religious equities and not at the local level. And I'm just curious if, if you saw any concrete evidence of energy and resources to sustain interreligious dialogue at the, at the people level rather than at the official level between heads of state and heads of, of religious communities. I'd be curious to get your perspective on that. Okay, um, we're, it, it, we've got 17 minutes left, and so let me join, let me jump into the uh, queue. We've got 20 some odd questions here, so I'm going to exercise my vast editorial powers and, and, and pull out one or two. This is from Peter Fan, who is a theologian at Georgetown University. Has the Vatican consulted the leaders of the Church of the East? on the impact of the Pope's visit on the Church of the East? Will the Vatican and the Church of the East collaborate together to reestablish the Christian presence in Iraq? Father Spadaro, would you like to, to take a stab at that one? Sure, of course. And uh, many patriarchs have been present during the papal celebration. So representative, official uh, representative of many different churches and rights, of course, also. So we saw the presence of Christianity in Iraq as a mosaic. Uh, and uh, Pope Francis underlined uh, the relevance of the um, polychromy uh, of Christianism. Um, that, was very, that was a very strong message he addressed. So the Christianity, not just as a stone, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, place for uh, uh, rich uh, with a uh, lot of diversity. So it was a great uh, step into a uh, real ecumenical dialogue. For real, I mean based on real life, not just on theological thoughts. So all of them suffered together and they suffered together together with the, Isla the, the Islamic uh, 
uh, people, so the the believers, the Islamic believers, the Muslims, so they suffer together. Uh, but the Christians suffer together, and so the Pope went to pray in a place when he went to Mosul, uh, where there were four churches, and uh, that was a huge sign of uh, not just reconciliation, but also a different way of understanding even Christianism as a mosaic. Thank you. Uh, Ricardo, do you want to, to add anything to that? I, I would say briefly that the, uh, that the Pope visit in my eyes gave uh, birth to momentum. Uh, the, um, the, the, this is really uh, uh, how you call it a turning point. Uh, what does it mean a turning point in my eyes? And uh, uh, I stop immediately. Uh, a turning point means that official Islam uh, is loyal to the states, not to Islam. Popular Islam is loyal to faith. So now, if official Islam start to listen to uh, popular Islam, they will start to listen to the faith of their follower, not to the uh, vision of their uh, chief of state. This is the turning point that this special uh, visit created. And I think that this comes especially uh, from what is said in Mosul. Uh, in Mosul, he made a speech that reached directly the heart of Muslims suffering from their own disease. And this is an immense step forward. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from John Borelli. Uh, the meeting between ILO's, Ayatollah Sistani and Pope Francis seemed to go very, very well. Are there any signs that the two of them and their associates will remain in contact as happened with Imam al tayeb after Pope Francis' visit in 2017? Yeah. yeah. Please. Oh, it's, yeah, sure. Um, and the, uh, Pope Francis quoted the document of fraternity he signed together with uh, uh, Al Tayeb uh, in Abu Dhabi, and that is the, the ground of, of further uh, uh, reflections. And uh, also because Pope Francis said that he wants to keep going um, in improving the relationships uh, between Christian and uh, uh, Muslims, but also. I think he became uh, uh, a relevant presence in the process be, uh, of reconciliation between uh, Shiites and Sunnis. This is very relevant and very original. It's very new. It's unbelievable that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Christian Pope is an element of reconciliation inside of Islam itself, talking about the pluralism inside of the uh, of Islam and uh, um, talking about citizenship, which is a very relevant topic, as I told you before, he started to, to talk about together with Al Tayeb, because Al Azhar uh, uh, is studying the question of citizenship inside of the Western countries, but also the Islamic countries. And so, what does it mean to be a citizen? And so, the, since Paul Francis and Al Tayeb signed together, uh, declaration about that. And um, he spoke about those elements, those contents in Iraq talking to Shiites. And the president uh, said that now, starting from now, we need meeting between the Vatican, al Azhar and uh, Najaf. Uh, you know, and the, the, the prime minister invited uh, Al Tayeb to go to uh, Najaf, to Iraq, to visit Iraq. You see, I mean, the, the doors are open. And this is just the starting point of uh, a movement, of a process. Uh, and uh, I think all of us should be um, uh, support the process. Mm -hmm. Ricardo, you want to add to that? Yes, I think that Pope Francis uh, got uh, better than any of us. 
that only a honest broker could step in this dispute. They were in need of a honest broker. And while he believes the human being uh, as a uh, relational uh, in, in, uh, person based on relationship, he first established a personal relation with uh, the Imam of Al Azhar, uh, Sheikh Al Tayyib. And then he started a personal relationship with, uh, and, and in this, this way, he is uh, opening the gate for a, a personal be relation between them because he is an honest broker. And the document of uh, Abu Dhabi was not uh, somewhere in, uh, uh, during the trip in Iraq. The trip in Iraq was a transformation in uh, human action of the document of Abu Dhabi. We have a question here, which I, I think was answered. So I may I may edit the question as, as we go on. Uh, Nazar Sloboda says, do you know why it was that representatives of Iraqi Jews did not join Pope Francis for an interreligious prayer service? And I think the answer was, there's so few Jews left in, in, in Iraq. So I, I wonder if I can modify the question a bit and say, in this ongoing dialogue, this hope between the two branches of Islam and the various branches of Christianity, are there, are there hopes, are there aspirations? Will there be uh, Jewish leaders beyond Iraq, across the Middle East or elsewhere involved in this ongoing uh, form of engagement and dialogue? Uh, for sure. And uh, in, there is already a, uh, um, a committee, they call it a higher committee uh, for human fraternity. And of course there is a Jewish representative who is a, a former Georgetown student. <laughs> And uh, so, and uh, Jewish are, are uh, involved in dialogue. And I myself asked uh, the Rabbi Loder, uh, which is the president of the World Jewish Congress, uh, of uh, um, uh, writing um, uh, a contribution for uh, um, a book we wrote, we published uh, on the meeting of Abu Dhabi, the creation of Abu Dhabi. So the presence in Iraq was problematic because there are very few and don't want to show, show off over there. So this was the, the, the question. But the Pope uh, quoted them uh, as first. So they, they, he said Jewish Christians and Muslims. Mm -hmm. So of course they are already involved in the process at the higher level, at the highest level. That's, a, that's very helpful. Uh, so the follow-up question that from Basel Flume says, is it possible to bring Israel into that dialogue? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, the uh, you know, the Holy See has a very good relation, diplomatic relationship with Israel, as uh, uh, with uh, uh, Iran. <laughs> so it's uh, the perfect place. Uh, <laughs> you mean the bad Holy See is a perfect place for this kind of uh, meeting. I uh, supervise also, I monitored uh, the Iranian press mm -hmm. as well as the Israeli and Israeli uh, uh, press. And I saw a wonderful article on the Jerusalem Post dedicated to the meeting. And as well as I saw uh, interesting articles in Iranian, I mean, uh, uh, newspapers in English, of course, uh, but also philo governmental, not just of uh, the opposition. So there is a kind of uh, um, communion, there is a, a common opinion, uh, which is pretty, pretty positive uh, in uh, considering the gesture and the words of the Pope. So we, there is hope there. That's very interesting. Let me let me move on quickly. Uh, and, and, uh, Ricardo, we'll pitch this to you first uh, uh, from Father John Titi of the Society of Jesus. Here in the United States, the coverage of the Pope's visit to Iraq was disappointing, even by the Washington Post and New York Times. Uh, for, for you and others who may know, what was the coverage like in Europe? What kind of geopolitical impact will the Pope's visit make in actuality? And how much has this visit impacted dialogue between the Catholic church in Islam and Judaism, or does that vary by region or country? So focus on the Europe question. What was the European press uh, coverage like of, of, the, of the trip? 
Well, I would say that I was uh, uh, really uh, surprised in good, uh, in positive terms, by the coverage of the French uh, magazine, newspaper, TV. Uh, um, I saw headlines, front pages about this trip. And uh, this is uh, very important for, uh, for me, not only for uh, the traditional relation of France with part of the Middle East, of course, uh, for the past, but also for the secular dimension of journalism in French and uh, of part of their culture. Um, if secular people got how important it is and French are important in this uh, context, in this uh, milieu, let's say, uh, then I think that uh, a step forward has been done also on this kind of dialogue. And this is a, a very positive. Concerning the Italian, I will say that is a, it was positive too. Father Spadaro, what, what was your read of the European press? Yeah, more or less, well, I, I agree. Uh, I agree, absolutely. So all of us, uh, all the newspapers uh, gave uh, a lot of attention to the, uh, the spiritual and uh, um, the moral um, relevance of the Pope visit, but of course also to the geopolitical meaning. Uh, I, I, I like to say, to add, that uh, the visit of Pope Francis was very relevant because he's a, a moral and spiritual leader, not because he's a, a political leader. This is why it was so relevant. And um, so the, uh, I realized that uh, uh, I'm, I'm realizing more and more day by day how relevant is Pope Francis in the dynamic of the um, geopolitics in general and the uh, balances in, in the world. Probably is the only moral leader of the world which is heard by um, everybody. Yeah. So we're almost out of time. Let me ask you a, a brief question uh, which has come up in, with several people. Uh, and that's the question of has was there any discussion among uh, Ayatollah Sistani and the Pope about addressing Islamic apostasy laws that make it illegal to convert to uh, a faith other than Islam? Did that come up in the conversations? Yeah, but we, we, we don't know because the, 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 pri the talk was private, of course. We have uh, pictures and some videos. We know that he stood up uh, four times, actually, not two, four times in front of Pope Francis. So. Uh, we saw the coaches, the simple environment, but we don't know anything about the words. And but it's interesting that the, the Al Sistani and the press office of the the press office of this Al Sistani and the, the press office of the Holy See released two independent uh, press releases, and they they were they are very very similar. So they say the same. They said the same thing. Well, let me give each of you one or two minutes for a final comment. And then unfortunately we will come to the end of the hour. So uh, Ricardo, any, any final words? Um, listening to the previous question, I thought that there are many other questions related to that. Um, so uh, for example, the famous fatwa of Ayatollah al-Sistani concerning homosexuality, uh, the new uh, family law coming up in Egypt, uh, and, and many others. We have a decision by the Moroccan authority that is the first in history uh, to uh, banish the apostasy uh, condemnation. Uh, this is uh, an important step forward coming from Morocco. Now, how can we uh, find a way to solve the theological disputes that are there since centuries? Only with the document of Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi with the declaration of the Imam, with the Pope, but of the Imam in this case, that recognize the right of any to be different and to have his own faith, recognize also the right to, of apostasy. It is there in the document, is written by him. Now, from saying so in, in a document and doing so in a country, it takes time. But 
let us give time instead of being afraid that time will never arrive. Thank you, Father Spadaro. We'll give you the last word uh, in a yeah, minute, minute or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Even even less than that. So it's uh, uh, Ricardo is right. I mean, Paul Francis started the process, and he started to get this this process together with uh, um, uh, Al Tayeb and now with the uh, Al Sistani. So it's just uh, the beginning. It's just the beginning. So on behalf of the Berkeley Center, I want to thank both of our, our speakers, our guests, Ricardo Cristiano and Father uh, Antonio Spadaro. Thank you for an amazing conversation and for your witness to the trip. Uh, and thank you for educating us and enlightening us. To all of you who viewed, thank you. And we will be posting the video uh, shortly on our website. Uh, thanks again. Uh, be safe. Take care.